uh, then, then, I, then, sorry, I'll let you. Go ahead. Uh, so till a Friday, uh, 2021, August 6th. Uh, we're talking about EES and DS3Q21, Firehose. So, so um, then, then I guess I'm looking for a name for um, what, what the unattributed inputs that we all scan, you know, like we're all out there scouting for information and checking out different sources that another of us, you know, haven't vetted and, and put an imprimatur on. We're, we're just, you know, we're saying, hey, is the CDC RSS feed or this or that, are they, are they good sources? Are there useful stuff? What is the useful stuff? How do we filter it to get stuff? We're just looking at those incoming feeds. Um, and it might be, it might be, I mean, obviously anything that gets into Mattermost gets there because somebody put it there, but um, what you can't do on Mattermost, but you could do on Factor is have, have stuff that's automatically and anonymously being presented to you. And I, I just wanted to attach, attach a name to that because I, it seems like it, we would want to create that input um there's that's actually an interesting one and and so that's pre-stage a for me right yeah, yeah um so like if i've decided that anything coming out of sidrap and in, in uh, minnesota i think um uh, mm -hmm. dr Olsrom and sidrap are doing like i i just trust 100 percent of what they they say right and so mm -hmm. i can see me attaching a factor stream or another RSS feed or whatever to stage A, the fire hose. But then I want all of those things to have my name on them. Um, so that, so the, the, the use case is, um, it's, it's super funny, by the way, watching uh, Stefan uh, try to keep up with the links, you know? And he's like, wow, there's some interesting different kinds of links here and stuff like that. What are we going to do with these? And I'm like, dude, we haven't even like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't even want to start sorting until we have like literally like 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 times as many links, you know, and then it's like, okay, what are you going to do with, you know, 200 links a day, you know, and not just links, right? The other thing that I think we're missing a little bit, I've, I've said this a little bit and I've said a little bit to Stefan is questions are like super kinds of things, right? Like, uh, can I catch Delta through my eyes? Like if I'm wearing an N95, I think I'm okay that way, but are my eyeballs going to have some aerosol particles on them and it's gonna end up in my tear duct and my nose and I'm gonna get sick, right? What's the, you know, am I, should I be wearing uh, goggles or not, right? That's a, like a, a brilliant kind of question that, you know, des deserves to be in the fire hose stream, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, the other thing I really like in the stream, the fire hose is like anecdotal stuff, which is usually not like good information, right? But anecdotal stuff like my aunt died or, you know, um, uh, I'm an ER doc and, you know, all of the people that have come in have, you know, whatever, all of that kind of stuff that's semi-signal, you know, that's like all the way. So the automated stuff for me, it, it's like, I guess, so... What I want is really like 100 or 200 or 1,000 like resource snippets a day, a factor cards or Mattermost posts or whatever. Um, and, and for each one of those to have somebody's name on it, and hopefully it would be like 20 or 30 or 100 or 200 people contributing, right? Um, and, and then you go, okay, this, P, this guy, Peter Kaminsky, all he posts, every time he posts something, uh, it's junk, you know, why do I want that, right? So you want the, the where I'm going with it is uh, you get a reputation score based on everything that ends up in the fire hose. And if you've got some RSS feed pouring, you know, 50% junk in your feed, you know, literally I want the next step to be something where most people have turned you, just muted you because you don't, you're not providing enough interesting information. So that's what I want to be able to happen. So it's okay if Michael is completely frozen. So, no, nah, you you were just paying attention. I was, I was staring. Yeah, I have to do that too, man. Attention. <laughs> uh, so, um, 
so you know if you're if you're adding signal under your name that's fine and if you're doing it automated that's fine if you have to if you end up deciding that you trust a, a source like sidrap and you you just route 100 percent of the stuff in that's fine if you if you look at a source and you go okay yahoo uh, yahoo finance there's a bunch of junk in that that rs feed you know i'm going to pre-filter it i'm going to send it into a factor stream and then i'm going to pre-filter it and then forward only the good stuff out of yahoo finance over that's fine too but it should by the time it hits the fire hose it should have your name on it um, so that we can squelch you basically so that somebody can squelch you so the other thing is when somebody squelches you right i don't say that i we can squelch you is kind of a weird thing to say or the, the quite not quite the right thing it's like the, the next filtering stage is, you know, um, Stefan might want to filter anything. He, he might want 100% signal by the time he's actually looking at it, right? So he might squelch a bunch of people. Some crazy person like me might want to look through all the junk. And even if people are pouring junk into the pharaohs, you know, maybe I'll sort through it. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to squelch them because one out of 100 things that they post is useful. Um, that's okay too. So that squelch button isn't global. It's, you know, per person or something like that. Hey, Wendy. Uh, hi, Wendy. Hi. I, I, hey, I Wendy. got a, I, I have a question that just, this triggered something that just popped up in my feed earlier today. I haven't followed up on. So there's a little op-ed or this little piece in the New York Times today that I saw linked to that. Well, I think it's an opinion piece that claims that people are getting better quality information from some of the socials than they are from the media, yeah. which I know we believe, but I'd like to see the article because it's, you know, it's just not a lead. It's like some piece, but the thing I just ran into today, which has me kind of nervous is that two people who I respect in the climate field about being grounded observers and opinion people, Basically, well, it's both in the climate field and also in the steady state economics field. Are both, are both like, you know, doing the like, um, whatever, dope slap, stupid, or like just either talking past each other, but getting a little ad hominemony. Yeah. And it's really disconcerting because... For me, both of these, like in the climate field, both of these people provide some signal that I find valuable. But the fact that they're like, you know, this is all of the comment was, oh, you know, zero, what is it? Zero emissions is just bullshit. And the other comment is, well, wait, zero is a number. We need, we need numbers if we're going to actually get anywhere. You know, it's like, okay, so now, now what? Like, how did we get to this point? And so I don't, we haven't run, I haven't run into that in the Delta stuff yet, but I'm certain so, that we may. So if I can, if I can reflect that back, you're thinking you're, you're, you observe sources that you trust and are good. And then they also get into petty fights and they start generating noise also in, into the same feed that, of, of theirs. Is that yeah. And, yes. And so I'm a little concerned. Uh oh. So how much, if it gets noisier, it's going to be, make my, work of trying to make sense of what's being I, I said a, harder i, I have think. a similar thing where one of my primo sources um is is very scientifically literate very public health oriented is really smart knows his stuff and i also kind of caught him like over generalizing some stats and it was a pretty sophisticated kind of like you had to actually look at the stats and stare at them and go this makes my stomach feel a little bit weird but i don't know why and then you have to like dig into it a little bit more and then it's like oh i get it the doctor you know only went through two or three levels of kind of disambiguation about what the stats really meant and he should have gone three or four levels and then so then like okay for that source you know how do i reflect that into the, the feed this is a source i i started thinking of different sources having uh one through ten or actually minus ten through ten ratings for them right um, so that doctor, I was like, well, he's a nine out of 10. He can get tricked up if it gets really complicated. Right. And then there's other ones that are 10, 10, you know, I've never seen them tricked up and they, they always say st smart stuff. And, and then, and then the negative score is the ones where 
they're a doctor, they know what they're talking about, and the way that they say things um, confuses people and um, and makes people believe the wrong thing, right? So there's a doctor that's a, a minus three at least on my on my scale. So I haven't done any of that, you know, I haven't haven't put any of that in the stream or anything, but yeah, I know you brought that up because it was like, oh, this is going to be potentially more complicated work. Yeah, Pete, I'd love to see the uh, the work you've done. I had a friend actually text me yesterday, and he volunteers for this group called Free Intelligent Conversations. Wow. Um, and basically, they sit down on a park bench or something and put up a sign, and people can sit down and just have a dialogue, basically, which is it's it has its pros and cons. I think it's an, it's a kind of novel, interesting idea. But he texted me yesterday ask, asking um, what unbiased news sources could you recommend because he wants to stay up to date in case people sit down and they want to bring up a certain topic. And I, was, I had a tough time responding. I uh, no, that's it. That's a I'm going to say say an opinion, which is a weird thing to say, but I, unbiased is the wrong way to say it. Actually, yeah. it's the wrong thing to ask for. Um, what's a news source that has a certain kind of biases, right? and yeah. doesn't have other kinds of biases because everything is biased and when you say unbiased it's like that's the worst thing that you can do uh wikipedia has ended up in that same thing where um uh, they have neutral point of view is one of their they have like two or three core foundational things right all articles should be neutral point of view it's like okay yeah. you can't have a neutral point of view even if you present two sides of you know some like contentious issue that's not neutral you know <laughs> so yeah. Um, so the trick is not to not to think of unbiased sources, but to think of sources that are biased this way, sources that are biased that way. And if you're good, you you curate a set of biases that gives you a, a whole picture. And then you want to like label each of those each of the things coming in from those sources with you know what you think their bias is, and then and then uh, recursively what your bias is when you're curating their biases, et cetera, et cetera. Pete, I'd, I'd like to at some point have a deeper conversation about that because I think there needs to be a word for either <clears throat> I'm trying to bring in all the biases into one location or I'm trying to make sure everyone feels represented um, that unbiased no longer means yep. because that, that kind of view a lot of people share and it's very kind of black and white. It's, I think there's a less biased <laughs> well, or, I, an, or an inclusive biasness, but I, I don't know if it's appropriate in this meeting right now. I think it is. <laughs> Sorry, new folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we don't have to like have that complete conversation, but I think it's worth thinking about. I think I, for where I am at this point, it's like there isn't a I like it's really hard to get to less biased or or more unbiased or something like that because I put myself in the the I I have um I have theoretical uh, theoretical you know fourth or fifth cousins in Arkansas right um, actually I also have much 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 closer uh, real family members that I talk to cousins and and even closer who are on the opposite side of vaccination and the opposite side of you know. Um, religion and all kinds of interesting things, right? So, I it's it's a real. So there are people who believe in science and scientific method and all that kind of stuff, and those are the ones who go. And it's not not to cast aspersions on anyone here, but those are the folks that go. Well, there's there's some kind of way that we can have a reasonable, you know, discussion about reality and things like that, and then. By demonstratively, de demonstratively, there there are people in the world who are like, yeah, science is an interesting lens on the world. Um, I believe in God. God's going to take care of me. Um, I'm really not going to get a vaccine. I kind of understand the the concepts and stuff like that. I understand you guys think science is the, the be all and, and end all. And I'm making a decision based on a different set of you know a different reality. And so. There are people in the world, there are people, especially in the US, demonstrably, that are just have a completely different world view from others of us. And you can't, you know, it's a disjoint set to, to start to put those people together, right? It's like, well, everybody should take a vaccine because, and then you can rattle off the stats, right? And 
probably all the people in that, this room go, yeah, it, of course, you know, back, the vaccines at this point are the safest medical technology we've ever had, basically probably safer than water, you know? <laughs> um, and and they, there, there are people who go, well, I don't feel safe enough or I don't, you know, and this is my, my, uh, my bias. This is my criteria for selecting whether or not I'm going to listen to you. And I've just decided that I'm not going to believe your facts because they're not my facts, you know? God said, you know, or whatever. I, you know, so, it's a really interesting thing, but I, I've gotten to the point where I don't think we have a shared consensus reality with 100% of the people. It's just not possible and, and not, you know, not super interesting necessarily. So, yeah, I, the project I'm working on, so Gullibot, is taking even disjointed views and making sure they're all represented and not balanced, but pitted against each other. I don't know the proper way to say it. So we're tackling that issue head on in this project um and it's hard and it may be impossible but i think we can get a little closer there's still a huge disagreement among people that have the same view but are debating the facts and that's that's where we're going to go and so even if unbiased just means in that in that in that scope or at least you have a shared as some similar to, I mean, everyone has different it's levels of shared one, reality. One of the things that's individual, right? really useful is negotiating about what your biases are with somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times a disagreement, you know, people get stuck on saying the same thing over and over. You've got to wear a mask. You've got to wear a mask. You've got to wear a mask. And they forget at some point why they're saying that and what their bias is in saying that. And when somebody says, no, I don't, no, I don't, no, I don't. Um, they don't necessarily disagree about the facts. They might disagree about their biases, right? It's like, yes, I have to wear a mask inside. I'm not going to wear a mask outside. I'm never going to wear a mask outside. And, and if you can figure out where your biases are and where you have agreement about the facts and the context of the facts, you know, then you can say, okay, I get it. I get your context and why you would decide that way. And I get my context and I, I you know, I understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. And, and now I, I, understand the disagreement you know we don't disagree on the fact that masks stop aerosols for instance you know we disagree on the fact of um, interpreting the data about you know um, airflow or something like that yeah yeah so we could go deeper into that conversation at some point but yeah that's exactly the bit that i'm trying to tackle with a few other people and we're seeing how close we can get to having a space where multiple biases are uh interpreted against each other so and, and understood and articulated yeah. and things like that. yeah I, I think the thing Bentley you said that my the word that struck for me was like can you know can my thoughts are they fairly represented in what you yeah. create you know collected or I want people to written down to, or whatever yeah. the I map want to you read drew it and they feel yeah. like they're heard like oh they said it better than I would have yeah that's yeah what I but I just say. think people yeah so people I mean, we want to be in a conversation. So, if we're, right, rather, I think most of us, rather than talking at each other, since it gets pretty darn tiresome. Um, but I, so, you know, I think that's the best we can do. And even in, I mean, as a, you know, as a physical scientist, I mean, even nowadays, I mean, there's no agreement in physical science. You know, I mean, we buried the causality thing years ago, so we could, we're not having that discussion. <laughs> um, so, it, uh, you know. Um, so what are some other things we should talk about on this call? Well, the flotilla, what happened? Are those boats still out there? Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, lowercase f or big, big up, uppercase f? I, <laughs> I, th I, th I think that this, this meeting we're sort of um, uh, floating on air mattresses with drinks in our hands with umbrellas in them, <laughs> having a good talk. <laughs> no, it's exciting. Not it's exciting to see so many faces here today, though. This yeah, is yeah, right. the largest flotilla call I've been on. Uh, Vincent, we we started. We got. I don't know. Actually, we, we did some interesting stuff with Factor, um, and I made Bill a fact an admin on the Factor stream for 
DS three Q one. It's three Q two one, um, and then we got into talking about EES and Delta. Um, there is actually I I was interested to talk about the way I think of this is Airtable actually um, uh, the the food sovereign um, which is now called Community Food Systems. Um, and uh, some parts of the flotilla are trying to stop the word, stop using the word sovereign um, and maybe using it uh, for in, uh, using independent or something like that instead of sovereign. So, so now that I've jiggered the uh, language over a little bit, um, community food systems um, is just starting to get its infrastructure feet under itself. Um, I'm helping um, uh, I'm helping Anne get set up with um, using some more Mattermost channels and using Massive Wiki and things like that. Um, but she's going to start needing an Airtable thing. So I can help her do some Airtable stuff. And I'm wondering if Vincent's going to help her some. Yeah, I can help with Airtables. I don't know um, specifically what it's for, but um, I'm sure I could help. It's, and I have. Um, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I have like a template for an Airtable for coordinating grocery deliveries that I made during the pandemic, which I could also share, but it just has to take out the personal contact information. Um, I don't know if, if that would be helpful as a starting point. I, you know, the, um, uh, we'll, we'll see. I think it's actually pretty simple stuff and, and it's, it's actually like, simpler than your um, brilliant schemaization can do. <laughs> um, so, but it's, it's stuff like, you know, project management, uh, which I've got some good, good basis for, um, uh, keeping track of uh, localities where they're starting to do um, profiling and mapping and things like that, you know. Um, I think some of it is just helping, I, th I think, I think, it's funny that those of us who Airtable, um, uh, it feels like this really creative tool. <laughs> um, it feels a lot more like an art tool to me than than a database tool. And it's like, you know, because, because either I'm with somebody or somebody says, you know, I need to keep track of this. And oh, by the way, you know, now I look at the table and I don't, I can't find, or I want to put something and it's like, oh, dude, just hack it, man. It's, it's, it's like a, you know, it's an easy to use art tool. Just, just change the schema, you know? Um, yeah. And, and, and part of, part of what I want to help Anne with is just that feeling of, you know, just, just go ahead and start hacking it around. You don't like get stuck on, you know, a, anything. So yeah. This is just related because my wife just uh, decided to adopt Notion to get out of Evernote because it really was cramping well, they made some changes that don't really support what she wants to do. Some of it has to do with a lot of dog training. And she has just discovered that Notion has tables. And inside tables, you can put all kinds of interesting little things inside those cells. And she was like, whoa. And I'm like, it reminded me of Airtable. But it's like, yeah, as soon as we get tables inside tables, man, we're like, we're done now. We are like, <laughs> we're cooking. We are really cooking. So... <laughs> I um, think Airtable air to me feels like paintbrush and Notion feels like a, a multi, multi-faceted chainsaw or something like that. You know, every time I pick it up, it's like, yeah, I got the sharp end, you know, <laughs> or it's well, like, why I would just, I want to cut like three branches at one time, you know? <laughs> well, I just, Susan is really, she's got some really, she knows what she's trying to do and she's really been more, impressed more by too. how tables, which I think, you know, that's going to be one of the I, tools, of know, the tools of the 21st century right now. Uh, Trudy Miller, you know, should, it is a notion, you know, na notion native. And, you know, she just like, so it's, it's like somebody, to me, it looked kind of like somebody juggling chainsaws, you know, it's like, damn, I wish I could do that. But <laughs> I also don't want to get cut, you know. <laughs> well, Vincent, I will say that Susan really thinks that it's way overkill. I don't need any of this stuff. But the fact that she's able to do what she wants to do with this dog training, and it seems really easy, 
and she's adopted. She goes, well, you know, they, I think they've adjusted me so I can work this thing. But I think it's going to be really, really helpful. Yeah. And one thing that's interesting about Airtable, so they recently launched this feature to have uh, what's called a synced base, which is a base that you could like pull the data from another Airtable base. And so this conversation is, um, I think, prompting me to want to open source this Airtable database that I have, which um, I put together a list of uh, locations. And so this is, uh, right now I have 320 here. And so I have it grouped into um, like location, I could group it by location type. Um, and so I have, let me see, I can collapse it. Uh, some are empty, but I have, I started off with the 51 US states, uh, six regions, um, 235 countries, six continents, and then some other kind of ancillary, like this is a address, it's a global location, it's international, it's multi-city, it's remote. Um, so these are like, not really like a, a nation state, it's just like a, another way to represent location. And um, yeah, I, I mean, constantly, and I was actually, uh, welcome Tiberius, uh, we were talking about like the balance between um, having like two stri strict and structured schemas versus being like flexible and open. And I think there's a balance uh, to be found. Um, and so like, a critique of like this as it is, is like, well, wait a minute, I don't represent location as nation states, I actually care about buyer regions. So like, I think, yeah, adding like buyer region and, you know, some other like letting people add to this as like different location sets um, would be really interesting. But uh, I recently just pulled, um, I found a database of um, flags. And so I have an image for I think like 80% of all of the different countries and then for states, I just have the US flag right now. Um, but yeah, this is like a pretty cool air table that I feel like if, if someone is doing something with location, instead of having to like enter in, uh, like re-enter in a list of locations, they could just sync this space and then like link to these different locations. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking about is like, well, wait a minute, locations also have like, different names and so I added a field where you can add like multiple like languages or names for how um for how a, a place is represented so like global is the same as international planetary world earth all countries every country anywhere any place um because all these things are basically synonymous and if we are trying to interoperate a bunch of databases that then have to do all that work of like figuring out what is the same and countries deduping is just like one of those things that I feel like we could preemptively dedupe things by having some shared schemas that that work. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That is awesome, man. Um, it'd be it'd be interesting to see. So I think I think you could find a bunch of that stuff in like Wikidata, but. I think the schema would be a lot simpler and and it wouldn't have the flexibility. So it'd be interesting to, I don't know, hook them up or something. And the, the other, thing, yeah, the, the other thing is like, I like took a few different country databases and they were different. I was like, this yeah. one is missing 18 countries. I was like, how do you do that? There's like only 200, come on. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, what's fun is uh, time zones. Um, and some of the, uh, one of the interesting things about time zones is they change over time. Uh, so, uh, the time zone, like the time zone database that Unix uses, um, has a, a lot of, um, like, you know, the, 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 the first, I don't know, the first 30 or 50 or something like that are, are super easy. And then there's a bunch of like really arcane ones, right? Like, so in 1906, you know, uh, when it was XYZ time at UTC, what was the time in Indiana, you know, on the left side of Indiana and the right side of Indiana, right? Um, and they have to, to represent all of that because somebody says, okay, I want to change this date, you know, from, you know, uh, Australia, 
1906, you know, uh, in March to Indiana, the right side in, you know, what, what's the time difference? And there's, there's like half times, you know, uh, half hour time slots and, and I think crazier ones than that. So representing that kind of like geographical stuff and political stuff and changes over time. And then there's like, you know, one, one part of the earth, you know, is claimed by two or more political organizations, right? So depending on what hat you have on, it's either, you know, this time zone or that time zone. Yeah, I told you I'm reading this history of the modern world from 1780 to 1914 and the early maps of the world from the late 1700s about how things were like represented in terms of the Ottoman Empire. It's like, whoa, that's so super different than what we're accustomed to. Um, I do genealogy and half my, my ancestors are Polish. So, you know, depending on what, what decade it was, Poland was either Austria-Hungary or, you know, the uh, some other empire. Or... Yeah, it was either huge or small or it's like... Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then, so the genealogy programs, you know, have a birthplace and a death place for your ancestors. You know, it's like, well, <laughs> you know, they lived here, but then they lived here and here and here, you know, and depending on what time of, you know, what decade it was, it's crazy. We uh, we had someone reach out a couple years ago about our genealogy. They did like before the the tests were a thing, and they did like basically did the research themselves. And we're all like proud Irish, and it turns out one of, one of our ancestors is were direct descendants from Cromwell's army, basically. <laughs> that one of the we're, we're from one of the soldiers left behind, uh, which is just an amusing thing to find out. Um, yeah, that's we don't talk about that guy. We don't, we didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Zeke, did you want to ask a question about collections? Yeah, I missed just the tail end of that. I could see in there it had what looked to be like a hash, um, a randomized address location for like the memory allocation. And I know that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like run off a of blockchain or anything, but I was just curious to see how that was working with the data parts of it. I just, I don't know, maybe if you can even show the graphic again, Vincent, that was look pretty- um, You're talking cool. about with what I was sharing? Yeah, because I, I didn't- Let me pull it up. have enough time to fully look at it. But yeah, so, um, and like, I'll show you also the output of like, what's the purpose of this, so. Um, okay, because it looked pretty cool. These are the kinds of stuff that I'm playing around with, like on a back end, trying to link these different pieces together and uh, using hollow chain like architecture, basically where you have different instances of your app run on your device. And so that you can kind of link the different parts in certain ways It allows for like customized filtering. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of, yeah, like, this the context is like I want to tag something and so I want to tag something with a location but I want the location to be flexible enough that it uh like can work across different like data sets so like these are different countries right so these are countries in Asia um then these are continents so Africa Asia Europe North America Oceania South America then um these are different countries in Europe. Um, then these are states in the US. Um, these are countries in Africa. Um, and then I also have uh, this top part, which is like type. So this is like global in person. So like this is a global um, resource. Um, and I guess the thing you could do with this is you could then have links between each one of these locations. So if I put something as like, Nevada, you know, Nevada is in the US. And so there's some like contextual stuff you can have there. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what you were asking about the hash. Like each yeah. one of these has an item ID, which is basically just, yeah, a unique ID for this um, record. And then these records are linked to each other. Um, some of the links are like pretty rigid, like um, for example, 
um, like Algeria is in Africa. This is like a, a continent to country link. Um, and then you could also like link a state to a country and you could link a city to a state. Um, so yeah, just trying to kind of capture the, the relationships. I, what, go ahead, what, yeah. uh, what system generates those ideas, those yeah. particular ideas? Oh, those are just an, that's just an auto generated number. That's the ID in, in, um, in Trove so that I can, it's actually the ID of that record in Trove. So that way, if that air table is used by other people, then that ID could then link up to the ID of that name in, a, in um, Trove. Yeah. A, a globally unique ID. Is it, um, it, it looks maybe like it's a bubble ID. Is that? Correct. Yep. So the format they, they look, of the bubble IDs. They look to me like uh, Mongo IDs. This is the, uh, let me get an ID. Oh, <laughs> actually that one was not, um, that was an old ID. Um, so this is the IDs that Webflow uses when I was um, hooking this up to Webflow. Um, and then there's a, a more complex ID that bubble uses. Um, here's the bubble ID. It's a little longer and they have like an X in it, which I'm assuming is separating two different parts. So Vincent, I'm curious if somebody, if somebody's bringing something from, from that wasn't created in Trove that they're not manually tagging there, but it does have location data, like say, a photograph that has location data or something that has open street map metadata does is does that are, are you creating something that accommodates those things or would somebody need to to re retag so location data there's like different types so okay how there's how i'm long, thinking yeah. about there's like pin like here right. on the map sure. which like yeah. could be lat long or it could be like an address which is like a right. can be converted to a fuzzy right. pin so that's that's like a separate thing than what i just shared which is like um i am uploading a project or a resource and i want to tell you what area this resource is like applicable in um right. or like be. right so like a grant right, sure. Where, what countries can you apply to this grant and i can apply in these three countries or these states or it's global so it, like the area pin difference i have like a different data type for uh, a pin or an address versus like location at area and then the next level is like the relationship between the thing and that location so like right. this is a headquarters this address is the headquarters this address is a address of interest. Um, this area is a, an area where our company is. This is an area where we operate in. This is an area where our customers are. This is an area that we're interested in. So there's a different relationship sure. potentially to the area. So I'm not really specifying that in that database. It's really just a list of the things, the options to choose from. Pretty random recognizing an ID type. I think the latter ID that I shared, the first part is the collection and the second part is the ID because those are two IDs from the same collection. Yeah. It's kind of like the brain actually. Mm. And then while we're talking about IDs, there's the classic new IDs. Yeah. yeah, just so uh, just to share a little bit with the group. I'm looking to do that kind of thing with a distributed backend. So and also, also looking to create ways for random number generation as well. Um, so yeah, I like this idea of storing these, storing these addresses, storing them um, as a hash map 
in a DNA instance, which would which is kind of what Holochain is using for the multiple instances they run on the applications, which allows access to uh, more large amounts of metadata. So I'm putting together scraping tools that would be run off of distributed backend that could then scrape and take all this metadata and we could create permission links between them. And so it allows um, an easier way to be able to pull up access to the different pieces of this data based on um, based on the different, based on uh, dis the distributed public key infrastructure. And, and the idea is, so when you synchronize things or when, when they, you link them up, what, what happens? Each, each system knows that they're talking about the same thing. Yeah, depending on what the permissions are like. So um, kind of like, uh, kind of like this, like imagine if you're, uh, like the larger vision is, imagine if you're, um, behavior in Uber affected a restaurant, affected a grocery store or hospital or whatever. The Sounds idea, like hell, man. yeah, the idea is you can kind of interweave these different pieces of things. And what's cool with the application it has to Trove is you can start collecting data so you can per permission. Um, so it's like, you know how the companies are collecting our data just like for free. And they're just like taking all our data. What this allows us to do is decide who we want to have access to the different pieces of data. And so it's cool because you don't need as many of the API bridge calls to make this happen. You can actually just kind of pull it directly from the back end. So it's a it's a it's an AI system that would automatically pull these different datas and then um, distribute it based on um, cryptography. Uh, you might want to look at uh, VRM, Vendor Relationship Management, which was the idea that um, I like not technically, but um, it started a long time ago, 10, 10, 15 years ago, something like that. And um, uh, the idea is that you should be able to, instead of having companies and a customer relationship management, you should turn it around and you should have vendor relationship management, which allows you to give different permissions and stuff to your, so you own your data and you let companies use it rather than the other way around. Yeah, so they've been thinking about things. it for a long time. Well, it's the Digi, Digi.me as well, I think is mm -hmm. is one, um, trying to think. And actually, it could be interesting as well, because I remember Judy a couple of weeks ago, I think it was in this call, she brought up that before she works with an organization, she'd like to know like what who they are. Um, so using something like this to create a personality kind of chart for an organization would be a kind of interesting usage as well. Um, yeah, sounds very interesting. Um, it reminds me, I, the, so in the news, big thing in the news is Apple um, is going after CSAM um, by fingerprinting fo photos and other stuff on your, your device and then magically syncing up with the cloud and so that they know if you've got any like horrible stuff on your phone and then they, they can report you to the the authorities. So that's an interesting thing. It's an interesting word to use. What's that? Interesting. interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's one word. Yeah. So um, it, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty interesting on Twitter right now, uh, watching the, the engineering folks go, okay, uh, okay, Apple, uh, <laughs> are you sure that's secure? I, one, one of the interesting things was um, who's going to manage uh, false positives, right? Um, so, uh, so say you've got a picture of your boyfriend on your phone um, and your boyfriend is 16 years old or your boyfriend is 19 years old, right? Um, so uh, how does Apple know that the 19 year old is maybe okay and the 16 year old is maybe not okay, right? Who decides that? It's probably not a neural net. It's probably a few people who have to actually look at the pictures and say, yeah, this is a 16 year old or no, that's a 19 year old. Well, I can just tell you as an older person looking at the Olympics, young people look younger <laughs> than they actually are. So young it really like, depends yeah. on, I think, who's looking at what their own, I mean, it's yeah. not easy. Not, easy. Not, not visually, no. Yeah. <clears throat> and and 
also there's a bunch of like potentially people who have potentially completely legal materials on their phone that you know are, are going to be under less than private scrutiny um to decide whether or not they're legal sounds like a whole big mess i'm 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 um, uh, it's really interesting that Apple's getting into it. Interesting is that interesting word. <laughs> yeah, I, wondered, I haven't read deeply, but I was I was wondering if they are if they're working with um, matches for known imagery as opposed to generalizing. Yeah. That's you know, the, it has a lot the, of flesh tone in it, you know, the, yeah. that, that kind of stuff. The, the first thing is um, there's a there's a database of known bad images right. uh, and, and hashes. I think they're just hashes of the, the digital data. Right. Um, so that's, I think, the first thing they're going to be doing. But somebody dug into it a little bit more, and they said it's actually not content hashing. It's neural hashing or something like that. So that threw a big question into what yeah. they're actually doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I but it's 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 opening up a Pandora's box that yeah that I mean, privacy I, I, advocates might not want opened <laughs> yeah I remember a physicist from a, an older physicist was talking years ago about somebody had proposed I think it was MIT had proposed some technology that they decided could determine whether somebody was lying you know and said they could use it in the courtroom. He was great. He said, that's got to be the ultimate invasion of privacy. Yep. And I had it when I was teaching, I had a conversation with students. And they said, well, you're not supposed to lie. I said, yeah, well, that's a social thing, but I could choose to do it. <laughs> <laughs> they just looked at me. I'm like, no, really? <laughs> Even knowing the consequences, I could still choose to do it. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like getting vaccinated. Well, but you have to get vaccinated. Really? Well, yeah, it's interesting. Why not, not just why not just lie about it and say you've been vaccinated? We're gonna have to lie down and take a nap after this. <laughs> uh, the the health department in um, in Chicago is, is asking folks who went to Lollapalooza to get a, a COVID test. Even though all of them promised that they were, you know, either vaccinated or have had a had false test, test before mm -hmm. they went there, maybe they were lying. So, Zeke, do you have a pointer to the software you're working on, or is it just literally behind the behind, the, the, uh, behind the curtain? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and still in the design phase. Um, Hollow Chain just got their release like, I don't know, recently. So I've been kind of waiting to, for there to be something to test out these ideas. So now that they've got their um, nodes up and running, I'm gonna play around with some concepts. So- Well, I just, I'm really interested. So I just wanna know where I could- Yeah, I've been I have, I have some homework. Good. learning a new language called Rust. Uh -huh. um, and I'm only still like intermediate with it. So I got to continue to improve my skills, but I'm going to be like playing around with some ideas. And I know a handful of uh, developers in there. So we're going to, we're going to jump on there and like play around with some of these concepts. So that's why I'm bringing it up because conversations like this, I think it's um, interesting just so people know what we're thinking about. And as we kind of come up with experimentation, I've been talking to Vincent about how, you know, there might be ways to integrate this. So it could be it could be really exciting. I think it has massive implications if you can get it to work. Uh, Zeke, do you have any uh, opinion about IPFS since you're yeah. into Holochain? Yeah, I like it. It looks really interesting. Um, pretty much what I want to do is build. It's, I was I was saying, saying this to Nate the other day. I want to take IPFS with hollow chain around it as a communication layer inside Dfinity. <laughs> yeah, that, makes that makes sense, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that's a really cool project. It's very exciting. And so I definitely plan on leveraging uh, that technology. 
uh, one of the um, one of the folks in our network is uh, Yuri Lagos. He's doing a lot of IPFS stuff. I think he's doing IPFS stuff. Yeah, actually, he's talking to him, uh, awesome. Cool. Yeah. We had an interesting conversation. He's a he's a cool guy. Very smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad you've uh, <clears throat> glad you've connected. Yeah. So I'm still a newbie, you know, when it comes to a lot of this stuff. I but I've um, spent a lot of years um, learning about blockchain technology. I helped uh, a couple websites get started up and doing their learn programs and advanced materials for cryptography and distributed network theory. So I've done a lot of uh, self-teaching. I don't have a computer science degree or anything, but I have a math degree. So I understand the advanced mathematics part of it. So I could read a white paper and explain it in a high level view. Um, and I've been teaching myself coding. I had experience. Um, I, I kind of really been doing coding since I was in junior high. So. I was in different engineering projects and courses off and on. So I have a lot of exposure to it, but this is my first time really looking to do it on a production level. So I'd say I'm a, a newbie. <laughs> I think you might want to, um, a few of us also attend the Collaborative Tech Alliance. And sorry, just to, there's a lot of people that are working on Holochain and working on blockchain there. But that meeting is, it's a rotating meeting, but it's on Wednesdays typically, but I can send you an invite. I, I think there's great. some pe people in that group you'd, you'd really like to talk to as well. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. Are you familiar? I mean, one of the, one of the groups in there, are you familiar with uh, uh, Hilo, the, the platform Hilo? Yeah. Okay. Because they're part of that, that gang and, and built on Hologen. Funny, I can't decide if if IPFS has been around a long time or not a long time. Because 2015, five years, six years doesn't sound that long, that long. But yeah. I'm also it, like when I think of it, it's like Vince Surf has been talking about it for a long time. It's weird. I don't know. Yeah, I looked at the Wikipedia too, and I was like, uh, like I don't know. I feel like. IPFS, like when I look at it on the Wikipedia, I'm like, oh, this seems like something that was like, you know, invented as like a standard in the 80s. And I'm like, wait a minute, 2015? Like, <laughs> like my like non-programming background is like, shouldn't have this been a thing like way long, <laughs> like long ago? So maybe that's why. A lot of the underpinnings of it go further back. That's That's true. Put a link in for Definity too. Yeah, Definity is my favorite project so far from a, a technological perspective. I don't know anything about the community or like the direction that they're trying to head. I'm I have to do a lot more research. I'm going to jump in and learn more about them because I've had not really great experiences with the hollow chain onboarding situation in community. I know they've gotten them better. They've improved their documentation and. Um, but I'm in, I am talking to uh, their community team to see um, how things can go because I was removed from the forum and uh, I have no idea why really. I mean, basically she asked me to not talk about my project, which was not really my project. It was a group of us trying to create a commons and we were just you know promoting that as an app to be built on Holochain. And then the next thing I know I was banned after giving them feedback at which they asked me for. And I, they, they even said, hey, can you give us some names? And I was like, well, I don't really want to say names on a public forum, but then they would only communicate with me on the threads. And so I finally just, out of trying to really help and give what my experience was like as a developer coming in, what I was going through and who I was talking to and what was happening. And the next thing I know I was banned and my posts were removed. So kind of felt like censorship um, and it was a little strange, but. Um, I'm in talks of getting back onto that potentially. And, uh, but either way, I've taken all the dev camps, so I'm very familiar with it. And I could, I could start writing haps now if I wanted to. I just don't really have a group of people to do it with per se. And I don't have a monetization plan. So I kind of need to like work on paid projects, but I love the idea of, of creating apps and, and I want to contribute to the libraries. You know, I want that project to be successful despite what happens on a personal level, I really just want the technology to get out there. So 
that's kind of my situation. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm a, a nice, easygoing person. And so I'm confused when people are interpreting things I'm saying maybe differently. And I'm not really sure, like, you know, I, I'm not really sure why these things happen. Like, I, I didn't, I didn't, it did not violate terms of service. I didn't say anything mean or anything like, uh, so I have no idea why a few of us, and, and I have heard other people have had this issue. So now I'm looking to be like, all right, well, I'm going to go plug into another community somewhere, even though I'd really rather, you know, be there out of lack of options. So who knows? It's weird. Community, <laughs> Anyone that knows me would be like, wait, what? You got banned? Like, how does, how is that possible? <laughs> community stuff is hard. And Holo has been like more famous than... I don't know. I, want, I don't want to say that they sh they deserve to be, but they've they've got a lot of fame, and they're internally their their structure is a little weird. I have no idea what's going on internally. It doesn't matter to me. It's an open source project. I just want access to information to be able to contribute. To well, it it matters to you. I mean, open source doesn't mean that it's all um, all s snowflakes and and diamonds or whatever. No. Um, so the, the I mean the it's kind of kind of the other way around, right? The community matters more than whether or not they've whatever their license is. Yeah. So, but yeah, I would like to uh, you know at least use it as a way to demo some of the stuff that I'm coming up yeah. with and a, a way to practice some code base. I mean, I don't know for sure that what I make is going to be usable per se, but I do, I do feel like I've got some pretty cool design ideas that I would like to get out there and um, really just uh, deliver more technology to these conscious projects. So my big passion is, is designing and creating uh, software as a service um, to empower regenerative organizations, allow for more transparency, and also to get people to support sustainable projects and buy more sustainable products really so that's like my big big focus is sustainability and giving people more options and empowering the smaller projects so that they because i kept when i went around to different projects to get their needs it's always the same thing funding in terms of fiat and maybe crypto and then developers and so we have a group of developers that have agreed to you know work on a project that then we will give the licensing to um, these different projects based on based on their based on what if they're sustainable and if they have accountability and they're, they're verified in certain metrics then we will just give them the license that they can use and then they can use that license to make money for themselves to generate residual income so it, it's not quite open source but it's open to projects that meet certain uh, verifications is kind of like the idea it is, it is an interesting idea as well because we've talked about at least in the cta about how you group how you make change basically and move away from extractive business models. And it is kind of people grouping together and holding, holding up a certain standard and saying we'll only collaborate with people who also hold up the standard. So it is a good way to, to make change and to, to, to easily group people. I don't know, it seems like a very powerful part of the mapping project if, if we can continue with Vince's project as well. Um, yeah, it seems, seems powerful. Can I get a jump off here? It's, uh, yeah, I think it's a good time to wrap. The, yeah, we have, we have to reconvene for, for the, the existential question in a couple, couple minutes. <laughs> or yep. 40 minutes. Yep. 50 minutes. Um, all right. So, uh, interesting um, call, all. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Nice to meet you, Zeke. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Zeke. Thank yeah. you. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll reach out on the email about the CTA. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Adios. Cheers. Bye, guys. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.